morning, everyone. So we start today with uh, Felix Ritor from the Universidad de Barcelona, who will talk about the variance and rule for entry production. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you very much, Edgar. Thank you very much, all the organizers of this great event, this great workshop uh, that I'm enjoying a lot. It's very, very interesting to hear all your talks. And uh, what I'm going to present today is a new result we have developed over the past three, four years, which concerns a method, an approach to derive entropy production of non-equilibrium systems. So here is a preprint, and you can see in the bottom of the slide also a mini review for the students, which has not directly contact with the content of this talk, but shows the sort of techniques we do in my lab to manipulate single molecules and also to do molecular thermodynamics and stochastic thermodynamics. So that's the content of the talk. I will, will start with a brief introduction to how methods to measure entropy production, non-equilibrium steady states, and that's a acronym, non-equilibrium steady states, NES. And I then will go to the variance room rule and the different applications, which will start with simple model systems and will finish for the case of red blood cells, which is a challenge for many of us to measure the entropy production. So let me just start this brief introduction. So what is a non-equilibrium steady state? Well, it's a state that is stationary in time. It exchange energy, momentum, chain, uh, charge, mass with the environment. And there is a net current between the system and the environment of what we call conserved quantities. So there are two types of non-equilibrium steady states. Those that derive from non-conservative time-dependent forces, so from a time-dependent potential, we call them force ness, F ness, and the other ones which is not necessarily a potential, but there is a net current across the system because we impose some certain boundary conditions. Okay, so a gradient uh, of potential will induce an electric current, a gradient of temperature will induce a current of heat, and so on. And this we call CNES um, for currentness, okay? Now, uh, the entropy production, how to measure the entropy production, so that's very old, uh, that's a very well-posed question. What we want to know in the NES is what is a net amount released per unit time in average from the system to the environment, because it's a conserved quantity in the case of the energy, so we want to know how much heat is released to the environment per unit time, and this entropy production is the power then divided by the temperature, because we want to have units of entropy divided by unit time. So this is a very classical experiment due to, actually it's a JAL experiment where you uh, use um, a pole, a pole you, move, you make a power rotate, and the friction coefficient between the pole and the water makes that most, in average, all the power you supply to the water makes the temperature increase, but at some point it does not go indefinitely. It starts to dissipate heat to the environment, and the average power you uh, pump into the system is released in the form of heat of entropy production, that's the expression. And by the second law, this is positive. Instead, in the case of the CNES, uh, we have a description of the average entropy production, which is given by the theory of irreversible thermodynamics. So it's the sum of the fluxes, currents, and forces, or affinities, over all different possible currents. Okay? And this, again, is positive. Now, in the stochastic processes, where we are interested in fluctuations be beyond average quantities, a useful description, or a simple description, illustrative of how to measure the entropy production is to take here the Langevin equation. So for example, you have system with a time-dependent force and you have a noise. The noise has some white properties, Gaussian properties. So the entropy production in power units, so I won't divide by T anymore. I will show always power in energy per time rather than entropy per time is given by the Stratonovich convention. That's a way to measure entropy production. So if you measure the force, and the displacement of your variables, so the affinities and the currents, you have the entropy production. Now this, if you measure uh, in a finite time, due to fluctuations, due to noise, this quantity is fluctuating itself, and there is a beautiful experiment by Chiliberto 
few years ago, in the case of a resistor, uh, Garnier and Chiliberto did beautiful experiment in which they measured the probability distribution of the entropy production, which are these functions depending on time, okay? The entropy production fluctuates more and more, develops longer and longer tails, and they verify the fluctuation theorem for steady states, um, and, um, and they produce these, these results that you see here in the slides, where they could verify the asymptotic behavior, etc. So this is one example of an experimental realization of the fluctuation theorem in the stochastic process, but there are others. Now, there has been a long development, uh, there has been a long time since, uh, since, this in, since these experiments, until more recently, where it was developed the thermodynamic uncertainty relation, which gives a lower bound for the entropy production. And you know most of you about it because it's basically a ratio between the average current and the variance. And there is a nice review that I wrote here uh, that I indicate here by Horowitz and Grinkich. The original idea was developed by Baraton Seifert, which I underline in both uh, type letters. But you have seen there are plenty of papers, and I missed many of them because it's a very uh, fast growing field. Naturally, there is a nice recent recopilation of all these results in a book by Simone Pigolotti and Luca Pelliti, who are here. Uh, in the audience, and then, um, well, it establishes a lower bound to measure the entropy production. So in principle, if you track your system, you track uh, any current, and you uh, measure uh, the statistical properties of this current, um, then in principle, you can get different estimates of the entropy production rate. And the question is, how good are these estimates as lower bounds for the actual entropy production rate? And uh, with uh, 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 Patrick Vietzonka, who was a student uh, of Udo Seifer, he came to Barcelona uh, in five years ago, six years ago, and we started doing some experiments with Patrick, and we tried to verify this for the case of a switching trap, which was a problem that we were studying like uh, eight, uh, seven years ago in collaboration always with Udo, and then what we did was we verified, we tried to verify this uh, inequality by uh, using two type of definitions of the current, let's say, of the work that was in this experiment. So in this experiment, the particles switch between two positions. And we had two definitions of the work that are complementary, depending on which is the control parameter, either the force of the position. So when you do that, what you discover is that the lower bound is here. It's two, because this is two kBT, and kBT units, everything. And if you take the ratio, of the uncertainty relation, then you are above. But you are, you are not above by, uh, by a few amount, you are above by a lot, and depends on the parameters of your problem, in this, in this case, the time, you can be a factor of, you can go from two to three, four, five, so this is more 100%, and you have to know that this scale is logarithmic, or you can go even higher in a short time. So there is, question is how good are these, um, in a, how good, is this bound? And then there has been other work, uh, subsequent work by uh, Chan Bong Hyun in, in Korea, in Seoul, in collaboration with, uh, with his student, where uh, they have analyzed different examples of model systems. They have taken data from experiments, and in this case, it's for molecular motors. And what they find is that the, low, the, the bound is really uh, far from what you can measure experimentally. However, this paper is not really experimental results. And again, this is for molecules, single molecules. And here in my talk, I want to go a step further. I want not to talk about single molecules or colloidal particles. I, go to take, I want to take the red blood cell, which is a much bigger object. So the question is why the, the bound is loose, okay? And the question then is uh, if we can use, if we can devise of a method to measure the entropy production rate just from a few experimental variables. Because the question is that we suspect or we think, and this is the common uh, understanding, that the bound is, uh, is loose because you measure one degree of freedom, you measure one current, and uh, it's not that you don't choose the right current, it's that, that there are many currents that are, there are many degrees of freedom that are contributing to the release heat, and therefore, of course, uh, you get lower bounds. So if you were able to take all the currents in a way, 
together, then that would be much better, right? So the question is that we don't want to take much currency away because we don't know how to measure them. We can measure just one or two at most. So how can we do in this, in this case? And here enters the variance sum rule, which is a very simple result, which is basically based on energy conservation. So I was trying to look when we uh, set up this new formula, I was trying to look in the literature in the past, but I wasn't able to find something similar. And why? Because, well, because uh, in principle, you are not interested to impose an energy conservation into something that you know that by definition conserves energy. But that's a trick because energy conservation is what sets the right balance between the power you put and the heat that you get. So that's the conceptually the balance from rule. Here you see the formula. Uh, the formula is very simple. It says that the sum of the variance of the displacement, the displacement in the steady state. So here I have a steady state, I have a trajectory, I have my coordinate, my variable that I measure, x of t, and I measure the variance of delta x of t. So x of t means uh, the position at time t minus the, the displacement is the difference between the position at time t and the position time zero, and I take the variance of the displacement, okay? So it's like, it's like the mean square displacement, basically. It's the same, and here I take the variance of the, what is called the cumulative force, which is a current. So it's not just the force, it's the integral between time zero and time t of the force. So this quantity grows in time, because it's an integral, and that's the reason why I call cumulative force, because it's an integrated force, it's a current. Okay, and you take the variance of this cumulative force. If you sum them, then you get 2dt, which is a normal diffusion, okay, plus this term, which is excess variance. So if you are in equilibrium, this is zero, and then this is exact. If you are out of equilibrium in a steady state, then you have dissipation and this is different from zero. That's the statement. Okay, so for the diffusion motion, the simple diffusion, there are no forces, is zero, so the variance to dt. This is a very simple example, you can see this way, okay? Now this is, the, again, the balance sum rule. What we propose then is, suppose you can measure the position as a function of time, the force as a function of time, you have these traces in your measurement, your system, so you have a probe, a physical probe attached to an S, can be a red blood cell. You measure the position of the beat, you measure the force, and the idea conceptually is uh, to measure the two variances. So here in blue, you see the variance of the displacement. In red, you see the variance of the cumulative force and the total variance, which is the sum of these two terms, okay, according to this. So the blue is here, well, see, blue cyan is here. Um, the cumulative force is here. When you sum them, you get the green. So the green, okay, differs from the dashed line, which is 2dt, which is this term here. This is a log scale, log log scale, by this difference, which is s of t. So if you fall on the top, s is zero. If you are above, and this gives you a measure of the entropy production. So how you measure the entropy production? This excess variance, s of t, has this definition that you see here. You can, is actually the integrated time reversal um, asymmetry correlation function. It's the integral of the time reversal asymmetry. Um, it's a time integral, it's the integral of the time reversal asymmetry between the correlation function, the, covari the correlation function or covariance of the position and the force. So once you know this, you can prove that the entropy production is just uh, this formula here. It's the second derivative of the excess variance at t equals zero. And if you work out the expressions for the, that I showed you before, you can obtain that the entropy production, rate of entropy production is this friction term here plus the sum of these two terms, one. This is a, v square is the net velocity of your particles. So you can have a net drift that contributes to entropy production, which is a Stokes friction term here. And then you have the second derivative of time zero of the displacement variance. And then here you have the variance of the force, not the cumulative force, the force at a given time. Whatever time, because it's steady state, so it's a number, okay? So here, these are numbers, everything. This is not time dependence, because this is the average entropy production rate. Now, this is very interesting, because this term here, um, you can demonstrate that, uh, well, let's suppose a simple case in which this term is zero, there is no net velocity. Suppose you are in equilibrium, right? You can demonstrate that this term is zero. But this term is zero because it's dif different from zero, and this is different from zero. But they are actually negative. So 
these two terms can be very big, and usually are very, very big, but ne of different sign. So they compensate each other, okay? So this compensation is somehow related to this energy conservation. So this rate of entropy production has this compensation between the two terms. Yeah, please ask questions whenever you have. Yeah, I, th I think I got lost in the derivation. Can, I give us, can you give us an intuition of what these different terms represent? Is there, is there a physical, because in, in the end you are decomposing entropy production, so there must be a physical uh, meaning of these terms. Well, sorry. So that's the excess variance, okay? So once, this is the term, the excess variance. So once you get the excess variance, you can get the rate of entropy production. Okay, and the rate of entropy production is just using the Stratonovich formula. So if you take this, okay, <laughs> and you calculate this term, okay, you calculate it. It's, a, it's not direct. That's the reason. It's, it's very simple calculation, but it's hidden because that's the reason why I'm showing you in this talk. So you can calculate right uh, away this question using always this setting. I'm using this setting. Of course, let me tell you that this can be generalized to multiple variables, n variables, okay? It can be generalized not only to n variables, but also to n component vectors. So you can have n variables with one coordinate, or you can have n variables with n multidimensional coordinates. It can be generalized, it holds. It can be also generalized to non-Markovian systems, but I won't talk about this. So it's very general, this result. With non-Markovian systems, it's a more complicated formula, but still you get the same. The same sort of relation, okay? But I won't talk about this, okay? So the two terms... Does uh, it work yeah. also for under underdumped systems, not overdumped systems like we... Underdumped have. systems, I think, to, yes, but we have not gone so far. But it should be, it should be, uh, uh, yeah, there exists also. But then there will be other terms, not just the variance of the displacement, but the variance of the velocity difference or something like that. But we have not worked out that. Yeah. So, just to follow up Simone's question, some years ago we did a, we were calculating the variance of the entropy production and there were a, the composition also and there was an extra term, I don't know if you remember, where there was a correlation also between force. So, okay, maybe they are related, we can discuss later. Okay. Actually, I have a question which could be related to yours. Uh, so, I understand there would not be correlation if the force is constant, right? But uh, what would happen if uh, the external force is time dependent, for instance? Time dependent? Yes. Well, this is a, t uh, this is a time dependent force. So, this, ah. so you see, well, this is a time dependent force, but I'm in steady state. But still, uh, this force here is time dependent. So, uh, so, so uh, okay. So, but the steady state, of course, is time transition invariant. Yeah. So, it's. Uh, Strict relies on uh, steady states. Okay. Yeah, it's just for non-equilibrium steady mm -hmm. states. That's I'm telling everything. Okay, okay. Uh, just uh, to follow up, and uh, this also, uh, what happens if the particle is in a confined well? Would oh, it... You will see now everything, yeah. <laughs> okay, this is the instrument. I wanted to show you the instrument because this is the experiment we do in Barcelona, and um, we have been doing experiments on everything you will see from now on. Um, these are the optical tweezers, so I was glad to show this slide uh, because uh, that's what we use to test these things. So the first example is what you just asked me now about an optically trapped particle in the, in the a, par, a, par, a bit, an optical, a colloidal particle in an optical trap. You can calculate everything exactly and you see how the trends of the two variances go. The variances go linearly with time here and then it saturates and here the variance of the force, okay, is quadratic, is much lower, so everything at short times is dominated by this, but at long times it's dominated by this. So if you sum the two terms, here is the sum. So that's the variance of the, of the displacement, that's the variance of the cumulative force, and they sum exactly to 2 dt. Because in this case, it turns out that S of t is equal to zero. Why? Because this is the example of a moving trap, okay, in water. And therefore, in a moving trap in water, the only source of dissipation is the Stokes term. So that's a special case in which the entropy production is only given by this term and everything is zero here. These two terms are zero. But each term is different from zero. 
So actually, when you do the experiment, what you measure, we, we feed the experimental data to the different parameters of the system. So this is gamma, the friction coefficient, and the stiffness of the trap. This sigma should be zero, and actually it is. It's zero with error, so it's minus five plus minus 10. Here you see different experimental measurements on different bits. These are time traces of about one, 10 seconds, okay? And you see the two terms. It's 3,000 and minus 3,000. So you get zero, but you need to calculate very well. It's a very stringent requirement that the two terms cancel out. So this is important to measure entropy production because it's an additional stringent test, okay, that you want that you want to get, which is energy conservation on the total entropy production. Uh, sorry, sorry if Alex, I have another question. Just, just uh, I don't want to get lost. So, uh, yeah. so you start the motivating by saying that there are many currents normally. And uh, at some point in your equation, uh, x was a vector. But then is, is x a vector or a one dimensional? No, but here I'm showing the simple example. Here is one dimensional. What I'm saying is that if you have an optical, an optical trap is three dimensional. Okay, I could do the problem in three dimensions if I want. Of course, measuring a position of the bit in three dimensions is difficult because you need to have also the coordinate of the bit in the optical axis, which you can, but usually uh, you don't know that. You, you don't use that. Here I'm choosing just one variable, one variable, which is the position. Because you can decouple. In, in optical traps, you can decouple the three directions of the force on the particle. But, but is the formula valid if you have a multidimensional system? Yeah. How does it look like? It's the same. Uh. It's the same variance from rule, but instead of delta x, you have delta r, and instead of uh, integral of the force, you have integral of the vector force. OK, thanks. It's the That's same. That's what I was asking. And what I said is that even if you put um, many part, so this would be one particle with three directions, right? three-dimensional particle. What I said is that it holds also for n particles, OK? System of n particles with different components, each particle, yeah. Felix, uh, to get this data, you have to measure the force, and you have to measure the position, right? Now, if you have those two, you can, of course, also get the entropy production directly. Yeah, sure. But we, yeah, sure. OK. We did that, and we saw that, and that's an interesting question, thanks for asking, because uh, when you do the usual Stratonovich, when you have the force and the extension, the position, then you get also numbers, but interestingly enough, you get much higher errors, because in, you have to do an integral in time, so you have to calculate differential of x, or Stratonovich. Now, it depends on your time discretization, and here there is not uh, so much, it's not so much sensitive to this time discretization even if you calculate the cumulative force, which is an integral. That's what we observed, okay? So you can also apply this to another example, which is a current nest. And here, there are no experiments that would be an optical trap um, in which, for example, you put a net torque and then your particle rotates, for example. So this can be realized experimentally in optical traps. You could do that, you could put a torque. But we have not done that. We have not done that. Uh, because we don't have this facility, but you can analytically compute it. I show you here two examples of this uh, rotor, this two-dimensional rotor. And uh, if you are in equilibrium, so you have here the balance of the displacement, the other term, and if you sum them to dt because s is zero. Here is a non-equilibrium steady state. These are analytical calculations. I don't show you the formulas, but uh, the, the idea is that we can compute anything, uh, everything analytical. You have here the variance of the displacement, the variance of the other term, and here you have 2 dt. Now, if you sum these two, you don't get 2 dt. You get uh, 2 dt plus something. This is what you get, OK? If you sum the two black, you get this black here, which is 2 dt plus this difference, which is exactly s. OK? So that's the conservation between the two, the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the quality. Now, interestingly, we, this, we found that we can use right away this um, variance from rule to get not a lower bound for the entropy production, but an upper bound. So you see, this is like a, 
this formula. So let's consider a potential, you know, a potential which is not necessarily harmonic. It can be any potential, and you move at a given speed. The effective potential is shifted by the Stokes force, and then you can demonstrate that in this case, again, the only entropy production is the Stokes friction, and S is equal to zero. So that's the variance from rule. Now you see that dash plus dash is equal to this, but everything is positive because these are variances, and therefore, if you sum two positive terms, you get this is less than this, and this is less than this, okay? Uh, so therefore, immediately, this gives you, because the variance of the cumulative, the cumulative force is actually the work done by the optical trap or the potential, the moving potential on the particle, you can get that uh, there is an upper bound for sigma rather than a lower bound. And you get this formula. So it's the same as the formula derived by everyone, by you and co-workers, but with the reverse inequality. And uh, actually, you can test experimentally. And you see here, um, we get the reverse, what we call the reverse uncertainty relation, which is that the entropy production rate sigma is lower now than the experimental data. But interestingly, it saturates for times which are much, uh, which are larger than their typical relaxation time of the beat in the potential. Here is an harmonic potential, okay? So this only we derive for this case. We don't know if there are other inequalities when you include excess variance. I don't know, okay? This we didn't explore. So now I want to show you no more the, the, what is the core of the, of the talk, which is the application to active systems, okay? Because I want to go to the last part of my talk, which is the calculation, the measurement of the entropy production rate in red blood cells. So the first thing that we take is an exactly solvable model because it's exactly solvable, because we studied in my lab during the years, and because we know how to measure the entropy production rate by using not only theory, but also stratonovich, which was a question by you. So we can do everything. So we consider this case of a stochastic uh, switching trap. So here, there is an animation, but for some reason, I don't know if it works, sorry. Okay, you see that, yeah. Okay, so the, part, so the optical trap switches between two positions and there is in internal relaxation time of the bit and therefore you uh, have some activity. And in this case, you can demonstrate that the variance from rule still holds and uh, what you get is an expression for the excess variance and immediately if you use the formula that I showed you before that you, Simone, asked previously about these two terms in the entropy production rate, you get this expression here. Well, it's a way to calculate it, which is what would you do, what you would do if you were to use a Stratonovich formula for the calculation. Now you can test experimentally, and you see the sum of the two variances are, are shown here already for three delta lambda parameters. So delta lambda is, uh, delta lambda is the magnitude of the trap displacement in this non-equilibrium steady state. So when delta lambda increases from the black to the red, you have more activity. And actually, corresponding to this more activity, you see deviation of the sum of the two variances with respect to the straight line, which is the dashed line you see here, which is 2 dt. Okay, so the, display, the deviation is the excess variance, which is this difference, is smaller for the black, which is delta lambda 200 nanometers up to 400 nanometers. And you can measure. Now, what we do is we fit this uh, variance from rule to the, to the, we feed the variance from rule to the, to the model with these parameters, we extract the parameters of the model, which is the stiffness and uh, uh, the mobility or the friction coefficient, and we get the entropy production measurements for different bits, which are shown here. So it's about 4,000, in this case, 600 kBT per second, and uh, you get here the theoretical estimate and the experimental values, which are affected by these errors, okay, which are because they are the compensation of these two terms. I know there is a question. Yeah. One question. Uh, so it seems that when you go for large times, it seems that this excess uh, variance goes to zero. Is this a general feature of? This excess variance what? Goes to zero for large times. Is the Very general good question. Feature? Very good observation. So actually what happened? What happens at very large times? It seems that it goes to, zero, goes to zero. No, it does not. Uh, and it does not in two ways. You can have two ways. And we don't have a general result, a general demonstration of this. In this case, the, the, the difference is finite. There is a finite difference, but in logarithmic scale, okay. you compress okay. it, you don't see it. In cases, in the case of non-equilibrium steady states of some non-confined systems, you can have 
a different, you can have a linear, you can have this, you can have an excess variance which is linear in time. So it's still linear in time, so it's parallel to the 2 dt because it's a logarithmic representation, but with a net difference. Okay. So you can have, uh, but the, the generality of what happens at very long times, we don't know yet. Okay. So you said before that this is uh, related to the asymmetry and the yeah. time reversal. So if you wait a lot of time, I expect that this yeah. somehow is washed out, no? Because you randomize the... But depends. It depends on the system. I don't think there is a general statement. Um, but it's finite. I mean, at least it's finite. It cannot go to zero. Thank you. I mean, even if you have an exponential difference between the two correlation functions, the integral of an exponential will be finite. So you expect that this term should be finite. Anyway, this is the measurement then, the summarizes the results for the active Ronian particle, sigma, the entropy production for different lambdas. So we go from 10 to the 1, approximately to 10 to the 4. We cover three uh, orders of magnitude in the entropy production rate. Okay? Now, it turns out, and this is interesting for what comes next, that we can rephrase the variance sum rule into a more applicable variance sum rule. In which sense more applicable? Here, I follow the a strategy that I know the position and I know the force. I measure the position, I measure the force, and I can apply it. But as was asked before, we can actually use a stratonomic. If I know position and force, why do I care about using this variance sum rule? In many cases, you don't measure the force. For example, in particle tracking. Single particle tracking, you don't measure the force. You track the trajectories, you measure the mean square displacement, which is the variance of the displacement, but you don't measure the forces. So what do you do in this case? So you can demonstrate that the case of the, the simple example that I showed you before, which is a stochastic switching trap, can be mapped into a particle uh, with, um, in, a, in this case, in a potential, in harmonic potential, for example, okay, in the presence of an active force, which is exponentially time correlated. Okay? There is a mapping, and therefore, um, you can somehow um, analytically solve the stochastic switching trap using active systems. It's the same. It's the same sort of model. Okay? Now, in this case, if, if you have a system which is, um, if you have a probe that is coupled to a spring, because all experimental devices are linear, you can rephrase, um, you can rephrase the variance sum rule in terms of the displacement, V delta X, and the cumulative force just in terms of this variance. Okay? just in terms of this variance. And then what you get is that the variance sum rule only involve, involves the variance of the displacement, okay? And here is the same expression. But this excess variance has a tilde. It's not the same excess variance as before. It's a different one. But still you have the same thing. And for the case of the stochastic switching trap, which is this active system, can, you can write an expression for the excess variance, which is different from the previous one. But you get, of course, the same entropy production rate because it's the same formula. At the end, you get the same. Okay? So um, in this case, you can, we can take the data. For example, we have done that with the experimental data they showed you before. And the experimental data are the symbols here. And the analytical exp and the formula for the variance sum rule uh, has been fitted with the parameters, which is the stiffness and the mobility. Of the, of the bit of the colloidal particle, and then you see that you can fit perfectly, and therefore you can get also the entropy production. So we don't need actually, we don't need actually to measure the force to extract the entropy production. Okay? So here, um, that was, uh, well, that was, uh, th that's the variance sum rule again, and he, this is another representation of exactly the same, just to show you the two contributions. I remember this is the term which is um, the variance of the displacement shown in red, which saturates. And this term here in blue is this term here, is the variance of this integral. So it's, it's this term here, OK? And again, it plays, the for, it plays the role of the corresponding cumulative force. So it grows up. If you sum the two, you get this, OK? And then you get a finite entropy production because you don't get, you don't uh, collapse uh, into 2dt, that's the line 2dt, and this is the excess variance, but now it's still there. But still you get a finite entropy production rate, okay? 
So now the question is, can I apply this to red blood cells? And this is the last part of my talk. Um, so in red blood cells, I have a probe that I apply, that I, I touch my bead, okay? For example, using an optical trap, I do a mechanical experiment, a mechanical sensitive experiment. I put my bead in contact with the system. And if I want to know the entropy production, I should know the total force acting on the bead, which is the sum of this force due to the optical trap and the force, the interaction force between the bead and the, and the red blood cell. Now, my optical trap measures the deflection of light, only measures the red vector. I don't have any clue about the blue vector because that's, I, I don't measure this force between the colloidal particle and the system. Of course, I know the average because I know that the average force of the, the average blue is the average red because the bead is in mechanical equilibrium. So I know that the average are equal, but I don't know this, the fluctuations. And that's what is important. The fluctuations are different. Okay, so what can I get only from only the fluctuations of the red, which is what I measure? That's the question. Just to make the story short, uh, red blood cells, you know, they are hemoglobin sacs uh, of uh, sacs of hemoglobin that have a specific uh, geometry. They have a very complex structure that has been elucidated during the years. It's one of the first cells that was investigated because it's, it's not a living cell. It doesn't duplicate like the other cells, but it has activity. It has activity because it uses sugar uh, glucose uh, to keep some internal activity, which is thought to be important. When you look, I mean, if you touch with your finger, red blood cell is like a mucus, you know, it's, it's like a cell. But it's flickering. It's flickering because uh, it needs to streak out through the vessels, uh, through the veins of your body to reach everywhere. So um, it has been studied for decades, okay? And the structure I show you here, just for illustration, but the question whether they are active or not has been also very much disputed since three decades, okay? Or for, I mean, since a long time. Because when you see it flickering, the membrane in the microscope, you don't know if the, if the, bell, if the, if the cell membrane is flickering because there is thermal noise, there's water, you know, the thermal agitation, or because there is an internal, internal activity. Well, now we know, and this is one of the papers that I think is more demonstrative from the group of Paco Monro in Madrid, that when you measure the correlation function, the time correlation function of a healthy red blood cell and an ATP, ATP depleted or glucose depleted red blood cell, uh, this is what we call a passivated red blood cell, which is a blue line, you see a difference in the correlation functions, so there are stronger correlations. There is more activity for the healthy red blood cell, and there is a correlation bump, which I think is a very clear demonstration. Another has been the work by Timo Betts and co-workers who measured the fluctuation dissipation theorem. You know that the system in equilibrium satisfies the fluctuation dissipation theorem. It, it does not. It's because it's out of equilibrium for any reason, and in particular, if it is in a steady state, it's producing heat is dissipating heat, there should be a difference between the correlation function, which is the squares here, you see, and the response function, okay? Correlation function multiplied by the frequency and the dissipative part of the response function, you get this difference. And this area, more or less, is the energy that is dissipated. So if you, there was a question the first day about Harada Sasa, so Harada Sasa is basically this blue, is roughly this estimation of the difference of the two integrated over all the frequency spectrum. Now, we did our own experiments, and we put in my lab uh, with my student, Marta Gironella, who was, has been doing the PhD under my supervision. Well, she was doing, we did experiments in which we measured the viscoelasticity response of red blood cells, are highly viscoelastic materials, and you can put the bit in contact in the optical trap, you measure these signals. And your red blood cell stays there, you see in the video, moving, shaking, but you measure the, this trajectory, this is a non equilibrium steady state, and you may ask, can I apply my variance room rule from the signal to get the entropy production rate? The answer is yes, and here, uh, what we used, at that time we didn't know we used a model that also has been used by, um, by Edgar, uh, Pascal, and, and Jim, I think they use uh, these sort of uh, models like, in which um, it's not exactly the same, but it's you introduce, you are interested in the activity, in the, in the fluctuations of the variance of your position, okay? And as I showed you before for the active Ronian particle, 
we can map that problem into just the position of the particle and get everything. So we did a model, but with a new, with an additional layer of activity, or with one more layer, which is interaction, apparent interaction of the membrane, the, the variable that you are measuring, which is a fluctuating or the fluctuation of the membrane with the cortex, okay? And we just did this model, <clears throat> and therefore what we did was, uh, of course this is solvable, you can get an ex analytic expression for the entropy production rate, and then the idea is that you fit, of course, the correlation functions or the power spectrum, this is what is done in this uh, work by Edgar Roldan, in which they fit the power spectrum, fit the power spectrum, but we impose the variance rule, which is this very stringent energy conservation. So the added element to just fitting parameters of the power spectrum or correlation function is to impose, impose this variance of growth because this is energy conservation. So this will give you more accurate estimates of the entropy production rate. Okay, so here I show you the reduced variance of rule from the optical twitcher, uh, tweezer stretching experiments we did in my lab for three different forces because we can stretch the cell at three different forces and again it works, we get and here I show you a slide in which I put together all the results we got for the experiments that we did in Barcelona and also the experiments done by Timo Betts. Timo Betts had published this paper in which he had his data. We joined the data together and what we discovered is that first uh, the entropy production rate, so this is the bit in contact with the cell. So this entropy production rate corresponds to this segment of the red blood cell. Entropy production is extensive. so. It should be integrated over the red blood cell. But we cannot measure the whole red blood cell, okay? In the optical Twitter experiment, we can just measure a one micron square section of entropy production, okay? And, um, well, we measured, uh, we measured the entropy production rate and we get these numbers which are high, as we expect from a red blood cell, okay? So it's, 2, 000, um, it's about 20,000 kbts per second. And here, Timo Betts did a different kind of experiment. We really attach specifically, uh, non specifically to a large section of the, we, we don't specifically attach the bit to the membrane, he did some sort of different experiment in which he didn't touch too much, he sensed the surface. So he put a chemical not to establish too much strong bonds, just to sense, because he did experiments not at 10, 20, or 30 piconewtons, he did experiments at few piconewtons, two, three piconewtons. He wanted to sense fluctuations. And then he measures this, he measures as lower, as slightly lower values, about 6,000. And here you see passivated red blood cells, which clearly are lower. I have five minutes, I have to go fast uh, to show you the results. So um, these are different, the reproducibility, these are different cells in the experience we did in Barcelona. We always get about these 30,000, 20,000, 40,000 kbts per second. And here are the most interesting experiments. We did experiments without bits touching the, red uh, the, the, the membrane of the red blood cell, we use ultra-fast optical microscopy in collaboration with uh, Paco Monroy uh, and Diego Herraiz, uh, he's a student. We carry out measurements of the flickering of the equatorial plane of the red blood cell, and we see the fluctuations. Here I show you healthy red blood cell. This is the trace, and the intensity of the color here is the magnitude of the variance. We did the same with passivated red blood cells using a drug to cross-link the, uh, to, to cross the spectrum network of the red blood cell, and the fluctuations are much reduced. And this is, if we apply, so we measure over the equatorial um, contour of the red blood cell, pixel by pixel, which is about 50 nanometers times 50 nanometers, the signal. And we measure the entropy production for each signal. We fit it the correlation function and the variance from rule to get the entropy production rate for that pixel, 50 nanometers times 50 nanometers. So we have like all these um, 500 pixels here around the contour of the cell. And you see, this is the entropy production rate across the red blood cell equatorial plane. Okay, you see these sort of fluctuations. And in blue you see a passivated. Passivated is going to zero. Okay, so we have the resolution to see the fluctuations, not only to measure the entropy, the fluctuations of the entropy across different positions. So this is like if you want the entropy, the rate of entropy production field, okay, of the red blood cell. Well, these are different red blood cells. You always see these um, patterns, and I want you to notice two things. Here I show you in green the variance of the displacement, 
and which is in green, and in red, I show you the entropy production rate. And if you look carefully to these uh, results, you will see an anti-correlation. They are anti-correlated, okay? But the more important thing, and yeah, we'll come back to the anti-correlation very, very right now, but the most important thing is I can measure the finite correlation length of this entropy production rate field. And we get for the sigma sigma, which is entropy production rate field across the equatorial plane, we get 350 nanometers of correlation length. And if we just look at the position, uh, we get a bit bigger, a large value. They should not be the same. We take here the average, but actually the important one is this one here. So we get about 500 nanometers of correlation length. And this anti-correlation here, this is important. The, anti, the entropy production is anti-correlated to the variance of the displacement. Okay? And here is the final result. That if we assume that we integrate over the whole uh, surface area, which is about 130 microns squared, the surface area of a red blood cell, this is what we get with optical stretching, about um, 4 million kbts per second for optical Tweezer sensing, we get, these are the results of Timo Betts, a little bit lower, and for optical microscopy, a little bit larger. And this is the measurement in bulk calorimetry. When you take your blood in a transfusion, they have closely packed red blood cells, and then they have measured with a thermometer the rate of heat produced, and this is 2.5 million kbts per second, which is there. So I think that this works. Future applications, very fast. I think this could be very nice to apply also for the case of the hair cell bundles that uh, um, Martin and uh, Hutzpeth uh, showed. Uh, also beautiful results by um, Andrea Puglisi on, on the sperm swimming. I think that that's another scenario where you could apply. Of course, all molecular motors. There are this beautiful paper by Kozuri um, from Salk uh, Institute in San Diego where he did DNA origami motors. He has very high resolution traces and also I think could be applied for particle tracking in general, for example, lipid wraps or active emulsions. Finally, I wish to thank the people who made this work possible. I already mentioned them, in particular Ivan Dieterlitzi who did all the calculations and Marta Gironella too and also Marco Vallesi, he did much uh, important contributions. Timo, Diego and Paco, I also mentioned them. Thank you, everyone, that uh, made possible this beautiful meeting. And uh, Edgar, Jordan, Sar, and uh, by Xavi. And finally, I want to mention, I have to do that because Entropy asked me to tell you, and actually they told me that someone should take a picture of this. So with the cell phone, because I forgot to ask if you could take a picture of this just to show them. That there is this topical collection, because they supported my conference in Barcelona last year, they want this. I do this for them. This, any paper on this uh, disorder in biology, I think is a very important topic. You are most welcome. And I leave you with this image that I took yesterday. It was lovely from Adriatico Guesthouse. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Felix. Um,